Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Pastor Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel? We invite you to get your Bible and join us if you care to. We're going to pick it up today, 1 Kings uh, chapter 3, verse 5. And Solomon came to the throne at the age of 19. And it was kind of a challenge the first year or two. Uh, he had the rebellion, if you will, of Adoniah trying to take the throne away from Solomon. <clears throat> he dealt with that. Uh, then Adoniah had some supporters, Joab, the uh, nephew of David, uh, general of the military. And Abiathar, one of the high priests at the time, supported Adoniah and Solomon is taking care of them as well as David had a little unfinished business that he wanted taken care of and Solomon polished that off uh, in, in good style. But in our last lecture, Dave, uh, Solomon excuse me, had gone to Gibeon. Now Gibeon is where uh, the tabernacle of Moses was located at this time. Um, and Zadok, the other high priest other than Abiathar, was located there. But Solomon has gone to Gibeon to offer sacrifice, and the Lord is about to appear uh, to Solomon in a dream. So without introduction, let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 5, and it reads... In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, Ask what I shall give thee. Now this is one of 20 uh, instances where the Lord appeared to uh, someone in a dream at night. This is the first of two for Solomon. Now think about that. The, the God of heaven and earth asking Solomon, ask what you will of me. The, the, the entity, our Father, who owns everything, asking Solomon, ask what you will and, and I'll give it to you. What would you ask for? Would you ask for maybe a new car or an airplane or a motorcycle? Well, take a lesson from Solomon, verse 6. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, loving kindness, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart or mind. You could translate that from the original languages with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. That promise of 2 Samuel chapter 7, uh, David was going to build a house for God. And God asked David through the prophet, when did I ask you to build me a house? And God said, I'll tell you, I'll build your house. And he's referring to his family. He said, never would there fail to be a man of your house to sit on the throne. That promise will ultimately uh, be fulfilled when Jesus Christ returns at the second advent as King of kings and Lord of lords. Well, you mean Jesus is, uh, is of David's house? Uh, absolutely. You're not familiar with Luke chapter 3 if you don't know the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And you know, this uh, is true of, of what Solomon said about David, of uprightness of heart or mind with thee. Was David perfect? No, he had that matter of adultery with Bathsheba. 
uh, he murdered Uriah the Hittite, and that's exactly what God thought about it, and it's stated as such in 2 Samuel chapter 12. But when it comes to worshiping God and sticking, uh, being faithful to God, uh, and you'd be pressed to find someone who did it any better uh, than David. Uh, most of the kings of Israel, most, all the kings of Judah uh, will be compared to David as far as that when it comes to whether they walked with the Lord or not. Verse 7, And now, Solomon continues, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child, I'm a, a young man, I know not how to go out or come in. Now Solomon was not so stupid that he didn't know how to go out the door and come back in. That's not what this means at all. This is a, a Hebraism, a figure of speech that means to go about your daily activities. And, and here we see humility on the part of Solomon and as Christ would teach in, in multiple places in the New Testament, if you exalt yourself, prepare to be abased, brought low. But if you'll humble yourself, God will exalt you. Verse 8, And thy servant is in the midst of thy people. Note here humility as well. He doesn't say, my people, I'm the king of these people. He says, thy people, which thou hast chosen a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. That promise that was made all the way back in Genesis to Abraham that, that the, your children, the descendants of Abraham, the Hebrews, if you will, uh, Israel would become as numerous as the stars of heaven and as the sands of the sea. And that promise had been fulfilled. Verse 9, Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad, between right and wrong. For who is able to judge this so great a peop this thy so great a people? Now note Solomon didn't ask for anything for himself. He didn't ask for riches for himself. He didn't ask for deliverance from an enemy for himself. He didn't ask for long life. He, he was very unselfishly asking for an understanding heart that he could judge the people of Israel with discernment. An understanding heart, the word understanding there, check it out in your Strong's. It's a Hebrew word that many of you are already familiar with. It's shama. It means to hear. Uh, even more importantly, it means to hear intelligently, to, to hear with understanding is what you could think about it. And how do you obtain discernment? Well, as you mature in your walk as a Christian, uh, your discernment matures as well. But Solomon asked for an understanding heart that he might be able to discern between good and bad. So if you ever are lacking discernment, ask God. Verse 10, And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Solomon utilizes wisdom in requesting wisdom, an understanding heart. And you know, God had to be proud uh, of Solomon's request. He could have asked for a, a new car or riches, uh, gold and silver and precious stones. Uh, he could have asked to live to be 125 years old. No, he didn't ask for something selfish. Uh, he didn't ask for anything for himself. He asked for an understanding heart so that he could judge the people of Israel. The sign uh, of a good king, the, the sign of a compassionate king. Just as a, a parent is pleased when, when they look out the kitchen window, a mother washing dishes, and 
uh, she sees her, her son playing in the yard with the neighbor boys, and she sees her son share one of his toys with the neighbor. It makes her proud that, that her son wasn't selfish, and, and God has feelings and emotions just like we do. Better said, we have feelings and emotions like uh, he has feelings. Verse 11, And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but has asked for thyself understanding uh, to discern judgment. This word discern in the Hebrew, it's the same word as understanding in verse 9. Shema, uh, to hear intelligently, to hear with understanding. Verse 12, the Lord continues in his response to Solomon. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. And this is not restricted to the kings of Israel. This applies to anyone in the flesh before or after the time of Solomon. There might have been one exception to that uh, when Jesus Christ walked the earth in the flesh. Uh, he was as wise or wiser than Solomon. But uh, Solomon was the wisest of all time in the flesh with that one exception. And you know, what's happening here is God is giving Solomon a gift of, of wisdom. And when God gives gifts, be careful not to take credit for it yourself. Don't ever forget to thank uh, God and give Him the credit for the gifts. That's the way uh, to receive His blessings, verse 13. And I have also, God continues, given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor so that there shall not be any in, among the kings like unto thee all thy days. And this, I couldn't help but think about Matthew chapter 6 on the Sermon of the Mount. Jesus was about to send the disciples out, and they were expressing concern about what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What, what are we going to wear? And he pointed out, he said, you know, behold the lilies of the field and how, how God adorns them in beauty. Solomon in all his glory and his kingly robes couldn't match a simple lily. And, and Jesus goes on to say at the end of that, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, the riches, wealth, uh, longevity, uh, will God add to you? And here's what God is doing. Because Solomon wasn't selfish and asking these things for himself, uh, God added them on to what he asked for, which was wisdom to judge uh, his people. Verse 14, And if, here we have a condition, thou wilt walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments, as thy father David did walk, then I will lengthen thy days. I'll add uh, to your number of years in the flesh. Solomon didn't note the condition. He didn't notice the if in what God said. Uh, Solomon took the throne when he was about 19. He ruled for 40 years before he died. That means he, he passed away at the age of 59 not very old, but again, he didn't stay with the Lord in, in obeying his statutes and his commandments. Those foreign wives that Solomon brought into Jerusalem brought their false gods with them, and he fell off into idolatry. The reason that the nation would be split in the next generation after Solomon. Verse 15, 
And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream, what a wonderful dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. It was not located at the uh, tabernacle of Moses in Gibeon at this time because David had brought it to Jerusalem and offered up burnt offerings and offered peace offerings, also called thank offerings in Leviticus chapter 3, and made a feast to all his servants. They had a sacrificial meal uh, for all of his servants. Truly a, a time of uh, joy, a time of celebration in Israel. Verse 16, Then came there two women that were harlots unto the king and stood before him. Now we're going to see the wisdom of Solomon tested early on. And the one woman said, O my Lord, to the king, I and this woman dwell in one house, and I was delivered of a child with her in the house. I gave birth to my son while she and I were living together in the same house. And it came to pass the third day after that I was delivered that this woman was delivered also. She also had a son three days after I gave birth. And we were together. There was no stranger with us in the house, save we two in the house. Just the two women and the babies were alone in the house. This, I think, uh, stated to, to make it understood that there was no possibility uh, that someone else did something to the one son, that it was uh, too uh, not possible, in other words, because they were the only ones in the house. Verse 19, And this woman's child, her son, died in the night because she overlaid it, this word overlaid in the Hebrew is shakab. It means to lie down, to rest, but it also means uh, to take within. In other words, what happened in her sleep, uh, not consciously, but in her sleep, uh, she overlaid the baby. She, she smothered the child. This is one of ten deaths in the Bible uh, that was due to the hands of a woman uh, recorded. Verse 20, And she arose at midnight, the, the woman who uh, smothered her own son, and took my son from beside me while thine handmaid slept, and laid it in her bosom, and laid her dead child in my bosom. The old switcheroo. Verse 21, and when I rose in the morning to give my child suck to, to nurse my son, behold, it was dead. And, and it was still dark at the time and wasn't able to see. She thought that it was her son. But when I had considered it in the morning, when, the, when there was enough light, a sufficient amount of light that I could actually see the child, behold, it was not my son which I did bear. And, you know, uh, when she saw the child in full daylight, she realized it wasn't her son. And can you imagine, you know, any new mother, uh, how, many, how many hours of that first 72 hours does she take just looking at the, the child, uh, studying his, his, his or her forehead, uh, his or her nose, and his or her chin, and certainly after 72 hours, this mother would have recognized her own child as my point. Verse 22, And the other woman said, Nay, or no, but the living is my son, and the dead is thy son. And this said, No, but the dead is thy son, and the living is my son. Thus they spake before the king. Very difficult situation. Uh, it's going to take wisdom and discernment on Solomon's part to judge who is right and who is wrong in this case. 23, 
Then said the king, The one saith, This is my son that liveth, and thy son is dead. And the other saith, Nay, but thy son is the dead, and my son is the living. It's one word against the other. There weren't any other witnesses in the house. How is Solomon going to determine who is right and who is wrong? Who's lying? Someone is lying. Verse 24, And the king said, Bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. I'll bet that got some attention. Uh, everyone in the room wondering, what in the world is the king going to do uh, with a sword to make up his mind as to who is right, who is lying, and who is telling the truth? And the king said, Divide the living child in two, and give half to one and half to the other. Of course, Solomon had no intention of cutting the child in half. Uh, he's setting this up to see what the women's reaction will be. Then spake the woman whose the living child was unto the king, for her bowels yearned, her bowels were hot with compassion, is what this means, upon her son, and she said, O my Lord, give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. You know, she didn't say, that's my child, the living child. But the other said, let it be neither mine nor thine, but divide it. Cut the child in half, and I'll take half and give half to her. The true mother thought better to give her son up than to kill it. You know, the mother cared more for the child than herself, just as Solomon, uh, in his wisdom, asked for more wisdom uh, so that he could judge these people rather than asking for something for himself. Verse 27, Then the king answered and said, Give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. She is the mother thereof. God had indeed uh, blessed Solomon with wisdom, wisdom and discernment to judge right from wrong. And all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had judged, and soon uh, most of the world, the queen of Sheba, uh, comes to mind. And they feared or revered the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to do judgment. And uh, this would make the people happy, knowing that there was a judge who had the ability, the wisdom, to judge right from wrong. Because it could be your case that comes up before the king. And, you know, uh, I couldn't help but think about that we have one judge, and that's with a capital J. Uh, ultimately, that's our Heavenly Father. Uh, he is the judge. I'm glad he's the judge because he is full of wisdom and knowledge and he judges fairly just as Solomon judged fairly. Solomon asked for wisdom and it was given to him. You know, you can do the same, beloved, uh, if you're not familiar with it. James chapter 1 verse 5 states that if any of you lack wisdom, ask God and you know, he won't uh, uh, chide with anyone. He'll, he'll give it to you abundantly. So uh, if you lack wisdom, don't be afraid to ask God. He, he not only gave wisdom to Solomon, uh, he's able and willing to give wisdom to you. And I'm not talking about wisdom in the ways of the world. I'm talking about wisdom in his ways, God's way, uh, and he will give it. Chapter 4, we come to the dominion and riches of Solomon, verses 1 uh, through 19. We'll have Solomon's various officers. Uh, we're not going to spend a great deal of time on this, but we'll make a few points as we work our way through it. Chapter 4, verse 1. So King Solomon was king over all Israel, all twelve tribes. Verse 2. And these were the princes which he had, Azariah the son of Zadok the priest. 
Now, this is not to be taken that Azariah was a priest. It's not talking about Zadok the priest. may have well been Zadok the priest. I don't think so, though. But this word priest is more a uh, chief officer. Uh, the, term, the, the title prime minister uh, probably fits. The king's representative before the people. Verse 3. Eli Horef and Ahiah, the sons of Shisha, scribes. These would be uh, more or less secretaries of state. Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahilud, the recorder, the recorder, uh, rem remembrancer, uh, historian would be a, a good title for this. And uh, when the king made decisions, the remembrancer or historian would write down uh, what the king's decisions were. Uh, when there was a visitor uh, from a, another country, that would write that down as well. Interesting to note, Shisha held the same office that Elihoreph and Ahiah held only under the reign of David. And it's interesting to note how many of Solomon's advisors if not the person who was also a counselor to David, uh, the son of the one who was a counselor to David. Uh, Solomon was wise in that respect. Uh, his son Rehoboam won't be so wise as we'll see in the next uh, several chapters as Rehoboam chose to, uh, to take the counsel of his young school chums ill-advisedly than those who advised Solomon. Verse 4, And Benaiah the son of Jehoiada was over the host, over the armies, and Zadok and Abiathar were the priests. Benaiah, of course, stuck with uh, Solomon when uh, Adoniah tried to take the throne. Abiathar went and supported uh, Adoniah, uh, Solomon had already sent Abiathar home with a warning, basically, you stay at home and, and uh, don't make any other uh, attempts on the throne. Verse 5, And Azariah, the son of Nathan, was over the officers, the twelve that will be from verse 7 and the following verses. And Zebud, uh, one of Solomon's nephews, the son of Nathan, Nathan uh, was principal officer and the king's friend, as Hushai had been David's confidential advisor. Now this Nathan here, we've been talking a great deal about Nathan the prophet. This is not Nathan the prophet, rather this is Solomon's brother Nathan, uh, who is, as most of you know, would be the, the seed line through which Jesus Christ would come. Luke chapter 3, verse 31 will document. Verse 6, And Ahishar was over the household minister of the palace. This was a, uh, an office that was not under David, but created by Solomon. And Adoniram the son of Abda was over the tribute, the treasury, if you will. Uh, he took care of uh, managing the levy and the taxes that were coming in. And at, at the time of David and Solomon, uh, all of the countries surrounding Israel were paying uh, taxes and tribute. Verse 7, and Solomon had 12 officers over all Israel. These we could compare to the 12 captains that David had in 1 Chronicles chapter 27, which provided victuals, food, and supplies, in other words, for the king and his household. Each man, his month in a year, made provision. And, and, and God's number uh, 12 in, in his organization, Satan's, is always 10. Uh, the ten kings uh, in, in the book of Revelation, for example. But what we've got going on here, and we'll see that there will be one representative from each of the twelve tribes of Israel. 
And it doesn't say as much, but it only makes sense that that particular tribe, one month out of the year, was responsible for providing uh, food and supplies to the king's household. And we won't get to it in this lecture, but in our next lecture, we'll see it was a considerable amount of food that was required to take care of the king's household and his court and all these officers. Verse 8, And these are their names, the names of the twelve, the son of Hur in Mount Ephraim, representing the tribe of Ephraim. We have the son of Hur. In the Hebrew, this would be Ben-Hur. I think they had a movie by that title, if I'm not mistaken. Verse 9, The son of Dekar in Mechaz, and in Shealbim, and Beth Shemesh, and Elon Beth Hanan. None of these are exactly known, or most of them are not exact location known at this point in time, but they, it is known that they all were in the tribe of Dan. From the book of Joshua, we learn, verse 10. The son of Hesed in Aruboth, to him pertain Soko and all the land of Hefer. And this would be, of course, Judah and Simeon. <clears throat> the son of Abinadab, this is probably, Abinad this Abinadab would probably be David's older brother, in all the region of Dor, which had Tephath, the daughter of Solomon, to wife. He was the uh, king's son-in-law, if you will. Now, this is a parenthetical chapter, which means that it doesn't chronologically fit. Uh, if you took the events of chapter 3 and the events of chapter 5, uh, chapter 4 is totally out of whack. We fast-forwarded uh, 18 to 22 years because we see uh, Solomon went from being a youth in, in chapter 3 to being old enough to be a father-in-law. Verse 12, uh, and we'll stop for the day. Beana, the son of Ahilud, to him pertain Teanach and Megiddo and all Beth Shehan, which is by Zartanah beneath Jezreel, from Beth Shehan to Abel Mihola, even unto the place that is beyond Jok. Nehem, and uh, we'll stop there for today. And again, you can read these names just as well as I can struggle with the pronunciation, but uh, it's interesting to note, I think in our next lecture, it's even uh, more interesting as far as the quantities of supplies that were required uh, to keep the, the king's uh, house going. It's, uh, it's astonishing, really. So with that, we're going to take a short break. We've got a message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It's getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. No shipping and handling. Just call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also mail your request to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout Puerto Rico, the U.S., and Canada. If you have a biblical question that you'd like to pose to be answered on the air, feel free to call that number and leave your question. Uh, please don't ask questions about a specific individual, denomination, or organization by name. Uh, we try to teach God's Word in a positive uh, manner 
throwing out negative about others, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ, serves no purpose. We won't do it. We'll let God's Word do the teaching, uh, the correcting, and the healing, fully capable of all three. If you're studying via the internet uh, or by shortwave radio somewhere around the world that's unable to use that 800 number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Quite all right to mail your questions in being the point. Got a prayer request? Well, we can do away with the 800 telephone number. You don't need a telephone. You don't need a mailing address. Your Heavenly Father is there for you 24-7 and you know, I think people are afraid to talk to their father sometimes. It's like, oh well, if I talk to him, I'll have to tell him that I did this and that, such and such. Well, guess what? He already knows what you did. And you know, if it's something bad, that's particularly the reason you need to talk with him, to ask his forgiveness. That's the beauty of Christianity, is when we mess up, and we all do, we all fall short at times. But the ability to go to your father with a repentant heart and ask for his forgiveness is the beauty of Christianity. We do have these prayer requests, Father. We come united as one in the name of your son, Jesus the Christ. We ask you to look upon these, Father. You know their needs, uh, marital problems, financial difficulties, addictions. You know, Father, and if it is your will, a special blessing on each of these. We also lift up our military troops who are in harm's way around the world, Father. Watch over, guide, direct, protect, touch, heal. In Jesus' precious name, amen and thank you, Father. All right, let's get to some questions and see what's on the mind of folks around the country. First up today, we have David and Susie in Georgia. <clears throat> Where in the Bible does it say marriage is between one man and one woman. And you know, there's really not much written in the Bible concerning marriage as far as the typical um, wedding vows are concerned. Uh, Genesis, and you know, <laughs> we have all kinds of, of examples in God's Word and where the, a relationship, a sexual relationship, should be between a man and a woman or else it is an abomination to our Heavenly Father. Uh, am I teaching hate toward homosexuals? No, I'm not. But I won't back up from what God's Word says. His Word says it's an abomination to Him. Now you can take that bit of information and do with it as you please, but uh, I won't back up. Uh, Genesis chapter 2 verse 24 uh, is often referred to in wedding vows. It states there, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife. The wife there is feminine uh, and feminine only and they shall be one flesh. And how can uh, two people become one flesh? Well, if they're of male and female, uh, the wedding also often results in a child being born and two become one flesh. Rebecca in West Virginia, can I anoint myself for healing of my body or do I have to go to the elders? You know, if an elder or elders aren't available, you may certainly anoint yourself. Uh, the power of healing does not lie with an elder uh, or elders, plural. <clears throat> Excuse me, it is God's and, and by you using the oil, it proves your obedience to Him. And if you're not familiar with Christians using anointing oil, you're not familiar with James chapter 5, verse 14, which states that if any of you are ill, uh, you go to the elders so that they can anoint with the oil of our people, olive oil, of course. And if you're not familiar with the anointing process, you can obtain olive oil at any grocery store. Uh, I recommend that people take a, at a pharmacy, a pharmacy can sell you an empty small vial. And you can take 
a little bit of the oil, fill the vial, and then you ask God in prayer to bless that oil as anointing oil, and you let him know you're going to use it in obedience to him. Uh, the rest of the oil, use it to cook or on your skin. It has medicinal purposes. Uh, it's, it's good for your skin, but uh, that's how you anoint. And then when you're ready to anoint, you take the vial that you've blessed, ask God to bless, uh, put a small amount on your finger, and if it's a, a person that you're anointing, you place a small amount on their forehead. And in prayer, you uh, state their petition, whether that's for healing, uh, protection from evil spirits, or, or whatever. If it's a, a sick home, that you're anointing, you anoint the doorpost of the house and you order all negative out in the name of Jesus Christ. Always anoint in the name of Jesus Christ. Robert in Washington, is it wrong for me to study with people of another testament of Jesus Christ without actually making a commitment to study with them? They gave me some scripture I think would really help my walk with Christ. Mature Christians can study with anyone that you choose to. Uh, and just as Solomon asked for discernment, you can ask for the ability to discern right from wrong. And as you mature as a Christian, you naturally are able to discern uh, between what's right and what is wrong. When we have communion, but we take the bread, the body of Christ, and the grape juice, symbolic of his blood, but the pastor does not state what the bread and juice stand for, they just say, take it with no explanation. Uh, give me some scripture to find the truth. Okay, well, Jesus taught us himself what the oil and the bread were for. Luke chapter 22, verse 19, and the following verses. Jesus t tells us exactly what the bread, he said, it's my body, uh, which is broken for you, take you and eat you all of it. And then they uh, took the cup and he blessed it and said, this is my blood, which was shed for many, take you and drink ye. Nicholas in Kentucky, I was saved, and you state the year, irrelevant. My basic language is English. I don't know any other language but English. I did feel the Holy Spirit enter me when I was baptized. I am saved, but the Lord and my name is written in the book of life. <clears throat> Would it offend the Lord if I could not speak in tongues. Would he provide me a way to speak in tongues or would he just let me speak in English? You know, Nicholas, <coughs> excuse me, all too many people are raised from the time they're knee high to a grasshopper that if they don't speak gibberish, uh, tongues as some people call it, that the Holy Spirit is not with them. That is false teaching. Uh, Acts chapter 2 verse 4 in the following verses, uh, the disciples of Christ spoke a tongue. It's the cloven tongue that's evidence of the Holy Spirit. And you know, <clears throat> they didn't need an interpreter to translate what they were saying so that others could understand as so many today do. Uh, the beauty of the cloven tongue of the Holy Spirit is that everyone understood uh, down to the uh, county in which they were born, the dialect. <coughs> Excuse me. Tony in Virginia. My mom is 96 years old. Well, bless her heart, she's lived a long life. She is always asking me to go to her church but they teach the flyaway doctrine. The chapel is my church. Please help me learn how I can help her to know the truth. And I, I understand your frustration, Tony. I, I know many people who God is blessed with eyes to see and ears to hear. 
<clears throat> but they have a, a relative such as your mother uh, who God obviously hasn't opened their eyes and their ears and it's uh, difficult. You, you want them so desperately uh, to see and hear the truth that um, it's frustrating. But, you know, all you are responsible for, Tony, and any of us is responsible for is planting the seed. And, you know, if, if God doesn't intend for that seed to uh, uh, germinate and grow, uh, that's his decision to make. And <clears throat> in that case, it's uh, you've done your part. You've planted the seed. Douglas in Louisiana, how did Cain die? You know, it isn't written how Cain died. The last time... Uh, Cain is mentioned other than in the New Testament, which of course was long, long after his death, is Genesis chapter 4, verse 25. He likely died of old age, logically. And, and how can we logically deduce that Cain probably died at an old age? Well, God promised anyone uh, who slew Cain that he would receive, they would receive his vengeance sevenfold. So, uh, pretty, pretty good uh, uh, cover of protection over Cain, uh, protecting him from someone else slaying him. <clears throat> James in Mississippi. Where is it in the Old Testament that says we are to learn line upon line? precept upon precept. Isaiah uh, chapter 28 verse 10 and verse 13 gets that said. <clears throat> Lori in Arizona. I'm wondering about the flood. Pastor said God wanted to destroy the giants, the uh, offspring of the fallen angels. Uh, that was Satan's plan to pollute the seed line through which Christ would come. If Christ had not come, Satan would have won, you see. But Pastor also said there were other people, there were other people on the boat. Where did they come from? Uh, who do they come from? Well, were they also impregnated by the giants? I'm not clear on that. I enjoy your program. Thank you. Well, we're glad you enjoy. Uh, studying God's Word chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Okay, Genesis chapter 6, verse 19, God instructed Noah to take two of every flesh upon the ark. And of course, before that, Noah was instructed to take his wife, his three sons, and their three wives on the ark. Why? Because they were the ones, excuse me, who had not, uh, mixed with the fallen angels. Their seed line was pure, and that, of course, was the seed line through which Christ was to come. But, you know, all of the races did not come from one family. That's biologically impossible. You can't take uh, an Adamic man and an Adamic woman and they have children of other races. That, that's not biologically possible. So <clears throat> to answer your question, where did they come from? They came from the sixth day creation. In Genesis chapter 1, there were men and women created that God instructed to, 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 be, to be fruitful and multiply uh, that were before Adam and Eve. That's where people get so confused. They believe and are taught that Adam and Eve were the first people on earth. They weren't. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 1. Who do we have? Marilyn from Oregon. Where did the rapture theory originate? Well, uh, not until 1830 uh, uh, A.D. where you find the rapture come into history you know, written anywhere by anyone. Uh, there was a woman by the name of Margaret MacDonald, and she had a dream by her own admission. She said that it was an evil dream, 
Uh, when she woke up, she started talking about the dream. Two preachers were standing by and heard it, and they took off with a new religion called uh, the Flyaway Doctrine. Uh, we offer a book in our library, which is not uh, a religious covering of the book. It's, it's a book by an author by the name of Dave McPherson, and he doesn't try and convince people one way or the other that the rapture is uh, factual. He, he simply presents the facts and lets people make up their own mind. Uh, we offer two books, actually, one, The Incredible Cover-Up, which is an abbreviated version. Uh, he also wrote The Rapture Plot, and you certainly don't need to order both of them. As I said, The Incredible Cover-Up is a, an abbreviated version. Uh, the, in other words, The Rapture Plot contains everything that you'll find in The Incredible Cover-Up, plus uh, uh, some. <clears throat> Gary in Oklahoma. I'm confused about the sons of God, the fallen angels that refuse to be born of woman. Please give me scripture so I can learn Father's truth. All right, the sons of God, which were the Nephilim, the fallen angels, uh, first appear in God's word in Genesis chapter 6. And they're called the sons of God there just as in Job chapter 1 verse 6 it's talking about the angels and the angels are called the sons of God in Job 1 6. In Genesis 6 they, they, they looked upon the daughters of Adam and they liked what they saw and they took them to wife and children were the result. In the Hebrew tongue their children were called Geber. Uh, this is the, the, where the giants came from uh, Goliath that David slew in the book of Samuel, uh, chapter 17. Uh, he was a descendant of the uh, giants. So, well, you say, well, I thought the flood was supposed to eliminate the, the Geber. It did, but there was a second influx of the fallen angels. Uh, if you have a companion Bible, uh, you have an appendix, I believe it's appendix 25, which goes into the Nephilim and the fallen angels. Also, Pastor Arnold Murray uh, has a work entitled Fallen Angels. It's CD 30423. You might give that a study. Pastor, can you please explain, this is from Burl in Alabama, can you please explain the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, John the Baptist states, I baptize you with water unto repentance, but he, referring to Jesus, that cometh after me shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At Shepherd's Chapel, when we baptize, we baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Being baptized with the Holy Spirit is no different than, than being baptized. It's you, Once you're baptized, you have the Holy Spirit with you. Mary in North Carolina, the woman in the wilderness is this Israel. If you're talking about the woman in Revelation uh, chapter 12, verse 13, and the following verses, yes. And, and even more specifically, the woman is God's elect. Uh, who will be pers persecuted by Satan, the Antichrist, when he is booted out of heaven by Michael, also written of there in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, and the following verses. Sue in Tennessee, please help me to find the right verses to share with my grandchildren. My daughter has cancer, and I don't think she's going to pull through. I want to teach them God's word. I'm scared. She has an eight-year-old and a four-year-old. Thank you for your service. Well, you're sure welcome. <clears throat> Make a note of Hebrews uh, chapter 13, verse 5, where we learn that where God says, I will never leave you or forsake you. And you know, you, uh, Sue, need to be a voice of strength, a voice of faith, for your family at this time. 
uh, teach your, your grandchildren 1 Corinthians uh, 10 verse 13 that nothing is going to happen to you or your grandchildren that hasn't happened to someone before. It's common to man is what it states there. It's happened to other people in the past, but God will never allow you to be tempted above what you're able uh, to handle without providing you a way out. Lois in California, I just wanted to write and let you know that your program is such a blessing to me. Well, well, thank you for that. May God continue to bless you and your staff. I have a question. <clears throat> what is the rapture? Where can I find this in the Bible? Well, rapturists believe that 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4, verse 16 and 17 are talking about the rapture. It's not talking about the rapture. You find the subject of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 in verse 13 where Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant as the heathen are concerning where those who sleep in Christ are, where those who are dead in Christ, those who have passed away. That's the subject of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Cheryl in Indiana, and I've got a lengthy question, and I just got the one-minute sign, so we're going to hold Cheryl. I promise you'll be first up when we come back in our next lecture. I do want you all to know that I love you a great deal. Why? Because you enjoy studying God's Word in depth. You know, what your Father says is important to you. You, you try the best you can to live your life according to God's law, according to His commandments. He loves you for that and blessings follow. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. One thing most important though, beloved, it's this. You stay in His Word every day. Every day in your Father's Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.